right. It just it's so layered though. That's the other problem with together, it. Harry. Yeah, it's just it it just keeps having layers because like when I first came out, I kept telling uh, first thing I posted in the wall chat was telling everyone like sit on this. I know you. Everyone just just lathering over like sit on it because new layers just kept coming out and coming out, and it's and it's pretty cool, especially when you. Oh, I'm just gonna go go on to it more, but I'll stop. I'm All right, stop. just wait, I'm just stop, wait, stop because it's just got so many cool layers to it. All right, and then <laughs> uh, and then we'll end up with uh, the. The hurricane, just so everybody's aware of what's coming this weekend. So, especially for our Florida listeners. All right, so here we go. That's what she said. So, uh, you guys get ready. Um, okay. Welcome. What, Harry? I didn't say anything. All right. Scared me. One thing I was doing is grab my phone because I want oh crap moment because you're ready to go and I don't think I put my phone on silent. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We Are Libertarians brings you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves. Think of us as the love child between National Review and Mad Magazine. We explain to you what the hell is happening in our world how, and how we can fix it by thinking differently. We try to make you sound smart when you talk with your friends. So please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, share this episode with friends, and support us at Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com. They're on the right side. We are supported by listeners like you, so $5 a month and up helps us grow. And we are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. If you are new to the program, we catch up for the first uh, little bit. This episode is a little bit different, and then we deep dive into analyzing current events and society from a libertarian perspective. This show is for adults by semi-adults, so please be warned, the language is strong and offensive. My name is Chris Spangle. I am the host and the founder of We Are Libertarians. We started in 2012, uh, five and a half years ago. With me on the Tuesday show, we record Tuesday nights, an episode, uh, Harry Price and I. Harry, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing well. And then, uh, as most of you, as some of you know, we record on Thursday nights with Greg Lins and Kat Anagnos, and then that is a different uh, type of show. And uh, this show is a, more of a news. Uh, we catch up on the news, take the big mm -hmm. stories of the day, and try and explain what's happening. And so you uh, basically... When you hear the word DACA, you know what's going on. Now, we're also joined by Brian Nichols, who is a contributor to the Libertarian Republic and has a podcast of uh, a, 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 a a podcast that I have no idea what the name is. Brian, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's the Around the Republic podcast. The Around yeah, the Republic the Around the Republic podcast on uh, YouTube. Yeah, uh, yeah, YouTube, and we're getting our. Uh our podcast uh, app up soon. Awesome. Very good. So be sure to check that out and support those guys. Uh, you, you're you a big fan of Austin Peterson, I would imagine, if you're at the Libertarian Republic. <laughs> you're my boy. Uh, I, before we jump into that, I do want to say you may hear some noise in the background. If you're watching on YouTube or in our uh, Dear Leaders uh, s Circle, uh, our Facebook group where we live stream, it may sound a little bit different, and that's because we have the windows open behind us and all around us because my air conditioning is broke, and Dear Leader cannot stand to be hot. So uh, you behind me is a black curtain that always has lights on it, but it's opened up, and you now see the uh, beautiful outside behind me. So I apologize if there's some noise in the background. That's what that is, but hopefully you won't send it, hear it with uh, our processing. But, uh, Brian, you are a big fan of Austin Peterson, and he is running for what, where, and in what party? Yes. So, uh, yeah, Austin Peterson, back on July 4th of this past summer, announced that he would be seeking uh, the candidacy for the Republican Party for the United States Senate seat in Missouri to uh, dethrone the incumbent Democrat Claire McCaskill. Uh, so that's that's where we're at. Austin is the I think one of two announced Republican candidates for uh, the Senate seat. Uh, currently, um, he is uh, seemingly the front runner. Uh, the other uh, top competitor, uh, Holly, he has not yet announced, though uh, it is is believed that he will announce at some point in time who is the current attorney general in Missouri. Um, so, yeah, that's where we stand with Austin. Austin has been going out. Uh, you know, shaking a lot of hands, going door to door, a lot of county fairs and such, and making a pretty big grassroots effort 
uh, to try to uh, to bring some liberty to the Republican Party. <clears throat> okay. How, how do you feel about that, Harry? Bringing liberty to the Republican Party. <laughs> I think it's a uh, uphill battle, but it's a battle worth having. Uh, I think it gives. I think Oscar Peters is testing out Greg is Greg's theory that parties are just empty vessels to you know effect change into. So good if he can if he does it gets more liberty out of it, more power to him. It, now now Austin Peterson, for those who do not know, uh, ran for the Libertarian Party presidential nomination. Formerly, he started the Libertarian Republican Liberty Viral websites, uh, of which Brian is a contributor. And he used to work for the uh, National Libertarian Party. That's where I met him in 2010 when I was with the Libertarian Party of Indiana, and he was with the National Libertarian Party as a volunteer coordinator. He's done some other stuff. He runs uh, – he, he's, he, he's a great communicator for liberty, is he not, Brian? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think one thing that we can all agree on is that Austin has a really uh, a unique way that can connect with people of very differing uh, perspectives – to try to bring some uh, unifying message of liberty. I mean, we saw during his run back in 2016 uh, where there were those in the GOP or those disaffected conservatives who were looking for a true alternative between what was Donald Trump as a uh, faux Republican and then uh, Hillary Clinton as a neoconservative Democrat, essentially. And I, I think Austin was really able to help bridge that gap and uh, bring some liberty uh, to the forefront. And he got a lot of... Uh, respectable support uh, from the likes of you know Liz Mayer, Glenn Beck, uh, even Eric Erickson, uh, you know who are who are pretty noted names in the uh, the lib or in the GOP movement and conservative movement. Um, which, if anything, it adds some credibility to Austin being a communicator that he was able to get those people on board in some way, shape, or form. He's always been conserv uh, like a conservatarian, I guess. And and it, would you say is he? Maybe Ron Paul is and Rand Paul, but he's definitely in the Libertarian Party. He's been one of the more prominent voices for a more conservative ideology uh, in terms of libertarian politics. Would you would you agree with that? I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's it's a conservative ideology. I mean, it, I think it's just a different perspective on the, the fundamental basics of libertarianism. So. You know, one of the, the biggest issues that Austin got flack was for his support of a pro-life. Um, and Austin's, uh, his whole premise behind the pro-life argument as a libertarian is that uh, if we do not allow the, the most innocent among us, uh, the unborn, have the ability to exercise their rights to even live, then, then how can we argue that that's a libertarian position to be pro-choice? Um, and I, I don't think that those who are in the pro-choice camp um, are, are you know monsters or anything like that? But I think it's it's a it's a very important uh, thing that we need to discuss as libertarians. And really, you know, I know we're going to have people butt heads no matter what. But I don't think a pro life argument for uh, for libertarianism makes him at all conservative. I think it makes him uh, at the very least ideologically consistent in his applications of liberty to uh, to all those uh, you know both born and unborn. Yeah, I would consider myself a pro-life libertarian. I believe that life begins a conception and that uh, the child in the womb has a right to life just as the mother does. Mm -hmm. um, which, but there's plenty of libertarians who are pro-life or pro-choice who believe that it is a woman. It's the life doesn't begin at conception. I, I guess that's what they believe and that yeah. that they have that their body is their property and their right to see as they like the libertarian movement. I would say is 50-50 on this issue. It's really one of, like, in greater politics, abortion is a very divisive issue, but in the libertarian movement, it's one of those things where everybody's just kind of laid down their arms and agreed that we're not going to agree on this issue. Let's talk about economics and war and privacy and other things. Right, Harry? Correct. Things that you can actually uh, affect and go out and change. My stance on it is that I am pro-choice and I choose life. So if you also want to choose life and you need some help, you know, I will help you. I will help you get through things. I will give you, get, help you get through those things. And it also, at the end of the day, it is someone else's choice. It's not mine. If sure. when it comes, I will make the choice that if it, I will, I will help uh, anyone help make that choice. If they need that help, they want just someone to talk to. But at the end of the day, my stance would be life, life always. Sure. Yeah. Because it is about protecting that other person's, that other person's individual uh, liberties in, inside of another person. So, right. Which it, you know, it's this position, and it, and it is a good 
like it's not completely split down the center, but it is a very diverse topic. It's and it's a third rail of any type of political discussion so if you have like any like you so you do this on a, like an open radio or a like a live stage and you bring this up it's a third rail and it gets people talking in the like the in the wrong way sorry about that you know, and it, it brings it up like i would remember being there on um at pork fest for free talk live and someone brought it up just on the radio and just like watch the whole crowd want to get up on the microphone want to talk about it or just call in and just want to talk about it yeah, so uh Brian, are you are you a pro-life or a pro-choice libertarian? I'm 100% pro-life. Um a little bit about I I you know grew up in a, a very staunch Republican family, um you know Christian family and uh you know not only is that the, the, the pro-life argument a tenet of my my personal beliefs in terms of uh, you know the the Christian faith and and you know really going ahead and valuing the the life of the unborn, but also, you know, as I, I you know, grew up through my, my transformative years uh, and started to really look into libertarianism, it, it fit with what I was looking at as libertarian views in terms of, uh, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for both those alive and those uh, who are going to be alive. I mean, the argument, I like, I, I mean, love him or hate him, Marco Rubio made a really great point back in CNN during uh, the presidential election where he said, you know, when you have an unborn baby, it, it's it's not going to turn into a tree. It's not going to turn into a cat. It's it's going to turn into a, a human being. Um, so you know, with that in mind, we need to treat the unborn as what is going to develop into a human being, which is something that is gifted uh, certain rights because of the fact that it is a human being. Um, so that's I, I kind of again I fall on that that uh, premise of of you know, the the unborn. Mm-hmm. Who are going to be humans having uh, some form of li- of rights? Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's what I said. Like it's a thir- uh, it's a one of those topics. Up like Gunther. When Gunther was born this year, Gunther went to the NICU at 30 weeks. Our like next mate and people that helped us inside the NICU that helped us go through and navigate. Their child was born at 20 weeks. So like watching this, right? They sat there at 20 weeks, watch his little bitty baby, and I've got to watch it. Get up to eight pounds and get discharged from the hospital when we got, you know, we gave birth at thirty weeks. Right. Sorry about that. My microphone was off. Uh, now, uh, Stone Aldridge, super fan Stone. <laughs> uh, first, I want to say uh, thank you to a couple people. Um, yes, I just into FaceTime with my best bud Jeff Ibert from Barstool Heartland because uh, I'm podcasting. But you should just forward him to Seth. Stone Aldridge uh, says that I side with the I side with quiz had sixty uh, percent pro-choice libertarians and 40% pro-life libertarians. And I would say that the libertarian movement, by and large, was pro-choice last decade when a lot of Republicans started to really move into the uh, libertarian movement. And I think Austin has has helped increase that percentage by being uh, uh, vocal on this issue. Um, So, and, and Jeremiah Morrill has it right. Like, abortion really is kind of a settled issue. Uh, and they're, the pro-lifers are really only kind of making little advances for their side in some of the pro, in the legislatures, but it's very small advances. It's mainly a fundraising issue. It's one of those issues that's really used to drive donations like gay rights. Like, gay rights is settled. Like, gay marriage is now the law of the land, and don't let anybody fool you otherwise. Like, it is just, it's never going to go back the way that the Christian conservative movement would like it to go. Uh, and I think as libertarians, we celebrate first and foremost the removal of government from marriage completely. But in the meantime, until we can do that fully, everyone should have equal rights under the law. Uh, regardless of your of your religious persuasion, uh, you know, you as a libertarian, I believe, are have a duty to have the law treat everyone equally and fairly. Uh, even if you yourself would not have uh, be involved in a church that would do gay weddings, I mean, is that would you agree with my assessment, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, I, I do take a little issue though in terms of uh, the, the settled uh, law, if you will, and and the, the argument that it's just a fundraising um, a fundraising technique. Because I think when when we as libertarians can look at the differences between you know same sex marriage and abortion. Uh, if we're going to be ideologically, ideologically consistent, in my in my opinion, um, 
I think we have to apply rights across the board equally, and that includes uh, the the right for you know freedom of choice in terms of loving the one you want to love, and thus entering into a contract with them to uh, you know show the the bond that you have uh, in in the eyes of the law. Um, but that uh, that liberty to make a choice, I think the liberty for someone who is unborn uh, should be applied as well. Now, I I look at the you know the the court cases that we have where abortion has basically been codified, but I argue that that it's not applied with the same type of standards that we have with same sex marriage. Um, so I think that you know if if we can change enough hearts and change enough minds uh, to the pro life uh, persuasion. I think we could actually see something, you know, come about in the next, you know, 15, 20 years, especially with the, the way that we've been able to start uh, getting some con- uh, conservative justices, you know, to tr- President Trump's credit in, uh, you know, Neil Gorsuch and, and hopefully a couple more in the near future. So I, I, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. So <clears throat> I want to thank Stone Aldrich uh, for his comment, but also for the birthday gift that he sent me. Oh, uh, Dear Leader's birthday is September 9th. And uh, as as I usually like to tell, I I will be thirty four, and uh, I was I was uh, I turned eighteen on nine dash nine dash two thousand and one, and I signed up for selective service the draft on nine dash ten dash two thousand and one, and on nine eleven two thousand and one I shit my pants. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank. <laughs> I want to thank a couple people for uh, giving me birthday gifts through our Amazon wish list, which you can find at the bottom of wearelibertarians.com. Uh, first, Craig DaCosta sent us a great uh, mic processor to help Greg with his mic technique. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we were able, and through another donation, I wish I had his, uh, his name handy. I'll have to look it up real quick. Um, another mic and another processor this week. Gifted to We Are Libertarians, and then I bought another processor. We're going to sound so good on Thursday it's going to be ridiculous. We're going to be broadcast quality, despite us having all of the windows open and fans running in the background of this episode <laughs> and the echo in the last episode. Uh, mm-hmm. Our game is usually a little uh, more on point. The so, on the road episode. Yeah, so thank you so much to Craig DaCosta. I literally had that processor in my Amazon cart, ready to buy it the next day, and then I, w- I showed up home, and it was on my front doorstep. It was beautifully gift-wrapped. It was so thoughtful and so nice of... Of Craig, he also became a one hundred dollar a month donor, a subscriber, uh, and he's now in a private chat with uh, you, Cat, mm-hmm. Greg, and myself, and Jason Doolittle, who's also another one hundred a month subscriber. So we want to we want to thank those guys so much for their donations. And Stone Stone was going to uh, Stone. Uh, sorry, I got distracted by the unbelievable entitlement of the Boss Hog uh, of Liberty podcast. <laughs> Apparently, being a secondary podcast on our network, like the Boss Hog of Liberty, which is the latest hit of the We Are Libertarians network. It's not that hard. But the, I know, but they think that they should get all my leftover equipment. And if you don't know what that is, each week, Jeremiah Morrill and Dakota Davis explore life in Henry County, Indiana. And they just had an awesome article written about them in the local newspaper, the Courier Times Journal, which you can see at the We Are Libertarians Facebook page. And uh, tune in on iTunes and sample them today. It says here that Dear Leader wants you to, but if Jeremiah asks me for another pair of headphones, I'm canceling the podcast. <laughs> he's, he, he's turning into the Bernie Sanders of the network. Go uh, the wall around his podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love all our friends at the, at the Boss Hog of Liberty. They're hosting my birthday party Saturday night, so be tuned to the Snapchat. We, the letter R, Libertarians, for that. <laughs> um now, uh, what was I going to say? But Stone was going to find some libertarian condoms, which jokes on him. I don't use condoms. What? what? I'm celibate. Okay, <laughs> that, that, that's just you, pervert. Uh, <coughs> he tried. Um, he tried, but he sent me a nice flag, and he sent me more D batteries than a porn star could possibly use in a lifetime. So we are stocked up on D batteries and A batteries and ready to go. So I want to thank him and uh, everybody who donates for my birthday. You are loved and appreciated. Now, I'm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to let Harry, uh, whoever he'd like, because I have to cough, and if I don't cough, I'm going to throw up. 
That was out of the blue. Um, I like to thank Chris Avery for giving me as uh, the super fan, give me my stickers because I've got other podcasts on my laptop, and I finally got a Weird Libertarian sticker on my uh, laptop, which I like having because I take my laptop everywhere, and it's nice to rep, you know, the podcast that I'm actually. Thank you so much, Harry. Uh, the Mark Kindred uh, donated some cool stuff to the network, so thank him. Um, so <clears throat> let's talk about DACA. So I started seeing about DACA, which I thought was like a horrible 80s retro band or something that had like had made a, a reappearance. But DACA started showing up in my news feed today, and I had no idea what it was or what it did. Mm. And so I looked into it, and it's the uh, – it is the – uh, it's an American immigration policy founded by the Obama administration on June 2012. In June 2012, DACA allows certain illegal immigrants who entered the country as minors to receive a renewable two-year period of deferred action from deportation and eligibility for a work permit. Yep. Now, DACA is um, – it affects a little under 800,000 people. And to receive DACA, you must have come to the U.S. before your 16th birthday. Mm -hmm. And uh, you must be under the age of 31 as of June 15, 2012. So most of these people are 25 to 35. Continuously resided in the U.S. since June 15, 2007. You must be in, high, in school, have a diploma or a GDED or veteran status. No felony or significant misdemeanor con convictions or else you uh you get sent back and you're deemed not a threat to national security or public safety now th uh th these are the so-called dreamers that we've debated uh about for a long time and these are 50 i think i heard today it was like 50 or 45 percent are in college now or have a college degree yep. uh so when donald trump talks about the bad hombres he's not talking about mm -hmm. these kids like these, these are not, they, they are not out there, you know, somebody's doing the raping, as Greg likes to point out. These are probably these are the kids that he said that he loves. It, he's, right. He said everybody loves the dreamers. And uh, so w w we want to explain this a little bit further. I mean, what are some of the things that in your research, Harry, that you learned about uh, DACA and the dreamers? All right, first off, uh, the DACA Act is the Deferred Action Childhood Arrivals. So that's. Um, like Chris said, this is for the people that got brought here in the back seat of some uh, back seat of a car, and with they're told to be quiet next to a cousin, who, and they get brought here to the United States. So they've never been to the you know their, their country of origin that they were born into. They've only known the United States. My background in here in Indianapolis, I was into the um, uh, I worked for a uh, catering company for several years. I got um, that took me out of high school out of college. I went and worked with them. So I've met a lot of these people that you know were from Mexico, Guatemala, of these different countries who have never been there. They've never been there their entire life except there was two, maybe four years that they were born and then brought to the United States. So they went to an American elementary school, they went to an American middle school, and they went to an American high school and here they are with an American education. They speak Spanish and English, but their their Spanish is crap and they barely in they only really speak English and they're trying to one go to college just and just get a job. And they used to right. get a good paying job. Now in when it comes to like a, most catering companies, they will you know, like most like in a hospitality industry, you can look the other way. There's a lot of you know they don't pay for a lot of background so there's a lot of these are the type of jobs that they will have to get so they and they don't pay that well. Right. You know, so like it's hard for them to want to start a family or do other things. Actually, have legitimate jobs, and but they want to do something else, and they just can't, so they can't go to school. And they're and they're stuck in this limbo, and they kind of always have been. And the part of the problem here is that this was done under the executive order, uh, because Congress wouldn't act on it. So Obama did it under executive order, and the the problem with governing under executive order is that it is not a permanent part of law, and the next president can undo it. Brian. Yeah, and uh, you know it's funny. I actually wrote an article. The uh, the week after the election, saying you know it's the executive actions that Democrats uh, had helped give Obama that is making Trump so scary. Because I mean, when it comes down to it, what what just happened to or I guess this past week with DACA, it's it's more I wouldn't say um, like a, a true end to the DACA program. It's it's going to be more of like a symbolic act because I mean honestly I really don't think we're going to see Trump. Uh, you know, go ahead with this. It's going to be more of a political bargaining chip. Uh, I mean, like I, I joked earlier, Trump 
said he's been on tape saying that he loves the dreamers the dreamers are the the kids that he says that you know he they should deserve to stay work with congress to get any meaningful meaningful immigration reform passed um which you know a broken clock is right twice a day and, and trump is 100 percent right here because you know whether you support the the dreamers staying in america as a illegal status or i'm sorry not a legal status but a uh, protected status or you want to see them deported it's not the executive's uh authority that should be determining that it should be through congress as it's it's uh, laid out in the Constitution. Um, I mean, really, anyone who knows how Trump operates, they know that this was done right now for the sole fact that, you know, Congress is coming back. Uh, this is going to put uh, DACA right on their table, mm-hmm. and it's going to be in the news. Uh, and it's going to force both Republicans and Democrats to take a position, unpopular or not, with their base, whatever it may be. And for Democrats, it's obviously going to be to keep the dreamers. And for Republicans, that's going to be the main uh, the main issue for them going forward because we're approaching 2018 midterms. And the, the polling shows that the whole dreamer issue, it's only really a strong issue in terms of wanting the dreamers deported with the solid base conservatives, which is, you know, I think it's less than 20 some odd percent. Whereas the general public, uh, by and large, does, they don't care. They they want the dreamers to stay, and and for for good reason, as we mentioned uh, earlier, as Harry mentioned earlier. So I think that you know, going back to the original point that you brought up, Chris, like yes, this is one hundred percent the the fault of a, a too powerful executive. And if anything, this should be another example of why uh, you know Democrats and Republicans should always seek to limit the the power of the executive, because when it comes down to it. You're only guaranteed your party in office as the executive for four years to eight years. So just like like we're seeing now, Trump is reversing in uh, eight years or not even eight years. I guess it was four years of Obama policy uh, just by him signing a piece of paper. So, you know, take it for what it's worth, both Rep- Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. And when it comes down to it, like the like my pure stance on it as you know, as I see it, is one, free people should be able to travel where free people go and determine immigration. Basically, if you can find a job here, you can work here, go ahead, don't care. But that's I, that's my purest stance. Right, well, human but, human freedom demands that people have the right to move where is most prosperous. And so yeah. in every, you when you see immigration patterns, that's where more freedom leads, uh, that's where more freedom exists. Mm-hmm. But uh, that that doesn't seem mm-hmm. to be uh, that doesn't coincide with the modern conservative movement. Right. Yeah. They don't really see. No. Yeah. They don't see that. And but in a lot of them, like also like so there are certain states that also tried to pressure tr- uh, Trump into making a move. Like they started a lawsuit and t- we were trying to pressure Trump to actually make a uh, make make a move onto it. Uh, but there are there's also a lot of a bad information out there on it. There's also a lot of fear. So if you're listening to this and you are some and you are a DACA holder, uh, do I understand that they're not uh, they're not going to take that registry list that registry list and send it over to ICE? That's not happening. They're just not going. Uh, deal with this. This is going to put pressure on Congress. I think. I, I, heard, I saw Durbin, Dick, Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois, and uh, Lindsey Graham, Lindsey graham yeah. uh t- <laughs> talking about this today, and they both seem to be confident that there was consensus in both house in the both the House and the Senate to get this done and and mm-hmm. and cement this into law, because the reality is, you if you're deporting a million millennials, you're deporting eight hundred thousand millennials. Back to countries where they don't belong. It's a political nightmare, and politicians are selfish, and they're going. And Donald Trump is selfish, mm. and so while it may be good for the base to punish this, he can get away with it if Congress passes it. But if he were doing an executive order like Obama did, he wouldn't. Now, for Obama, uh, it's rare for a president to criticize uh, the predecessor. I don't think you've ever heard. Um, any time that, yes, there's a bird outside, that's what you hear in the background, you hear the highway, <laughs> I'm right by I-65 or 69, I don't know which one. No, I was going to talk about, like, no, Obama criticized Bush all the time. Well, that was, no, as sitting president, his predecessor, yes. But when you are the former president, you don't talk about your predecessor. 
So it like if you listen to George Bush speak today, even I heard George Bush give a speech at uh, in New York after he released a book of his paintings uh, recently, and he he. He he said, you know, people who followed me in the office may or may not have done things that I wouldn't have done, but, you know, here's my opinion on it. Like, he didn't even say Obama's name. Like, he's just mm -hmm. very, like, trying not to criticize former presidents. Bill Clinton did not do that with George Bush. Right. And Barack Obama has, uh, has not really done that with Trump until today. And uh, Barack Obama wrote on his Facebook page, you can see the whole statement there, but uh, he said, to target these young people is wrong because they have done nothing wrong. It is self-defeating because they want to start new businesses, staff our labs, serve in our military, and otherwise contribute to the country we love. It is cruel. Uh, so he, he uh, took criticism, uh, he criticized the sitting president, which is usually pretty uncommon for some of the dude to their predecessor, but there's nothing common about Donald Trump, and uh, I, I would expect to, to just get used to every president from here on out criticizing Donald Trump ever. Yeah, so it's it's going to be the easy one, but like most of the disinformation, like the conservative, be so popular. Yeah, the conservative red meat also on this is that they can also do is like the people who are former dreamers or or people, DACA members that they can easily like. Well, if you're a DACA. They can make an easily express lane for American citizenship if you want that. <laughs> right. But the other thing is, too, is like the DACA program, it really, to me, going more research into this, into this immigration thing for DACA, it just more of a seemed like a stale over or a do nothing bill, basically. Granted, I saw people signing up for this because this one thing was quick and easy. This was quick, easy. You fill up this form. Now, you some some people who are diff out there, like, what do you mean this wasn't easy? Hey, it's a heck of a lot easier than hiring an immigration attorney and going through all the different steps. Because if you could, if you applied for DACA, you could have got an immigration attorney and spent, granted, thousands of dollars on all these steps. You could have got your green card and visa or worked your way to American citizenship here. I love Donald's uh, tweet today at 8.04 a.m., Congress, get ready to do your job. DACA! <laughs> it's just D-A-C-A exclamation point. It was it's so bizarre. Uh, now, final thoughts on DACA. Brian, go ahead. Brian Nichols of the Libertarian Republic with this. Yeah, um, I mean, final thoughts on DACA. I personally think that if you have been in America a majority of your life and, and you have done nothing wrong, then you... Know, you there's no reason you shouldn't stay. If you're a productive member of society, then then be a productive member of society. I don't care where you were born. Um, but I think, again, it comes down to looking at what Trump just did. That is something that we'd be worried about as as both you know libertarians, Republicans, conservatives, Democrats, because you know it, it just takes the the this, you know swipe of a pen to change uh, everything. And and if we're not going to stand up and actually push for you know, our, our elected officials to follow constitutional uh, you know, procedures and do immigration as it's supposed to be done through Congress, then uh, then we're just going to see in four or eight years, uh, you know, the exact opposite happen. So mm -hmm. get to work. I agree with Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Harry? Greg Lenz smiles somewhere. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> it's probably, he probably does. With the whole DACA fiasco thing, it has to... You have to keep the DACA members for the simple fact of, to to me, if you bind the stupid system of the United States and go with it, in order for the Ponzi scheme of Social Security to keep going and to, it's it's kind of hard to remain solvent because, but it's a Ponzi scheme. So if you keep pumping in with members, it keeps the Ponzi scheme going. So you need the extra, you need these immigrants. It's Good point. Good yeah. Point. Yeah. So let's move on to North Korea. North Korea escalated. North uh, Korea. North Korea? What did I say? <laughs> uh, so North Korea, don't distract me, Harry. Uh, you're on double secret probation as a co-host. Don't, don't test me. <laughs> uh, so uh, North Korea, what did North Korea do this week? They launched like the biggest nuclear test. There was like a, it shook the Richter scale or what, what happened, Harry or Brian? I, I, my show prep on this fell apart as it usually does when it comes to North Korea because I just kind of don't care. They did several different things. They uh, did. They launched a uh, missile into uh, back into the sea over Japan. They right. also claim they claim to uh, to uh, did a hydrogen bomb test in up in, underground in North Korea, which I 
personally, I claim bull crap on. Right. If you do any research into like the hydrogen bottles, like they would have to have one, the, one they have to get the material for it and then get it refined correctly. Uh, two, they have to have all the need to be able to, to run this thing. Now, granted, could they've had it with enough nuclear reactors? Yeah, maybe. Possibly, but the, the hydrogen, the the way a hydrogen bomb works, they're going to need a lot of freaking power. Right. And most hydrogen bombs are not yeah. portable. Yeah, it's it's too hard. It's more of a good scare tactic. It's more of like if they if they. But the thing is, you can still do this. I don't know if to say the same effect with like enough bomb underground to just shake something. It's more of like in order to know they actually had a, a nuclear bomb or like a hydrogen bomb, you, you really have to test the soil. Brian? Sorry, Brian. Brian. No, no. I mean, those, <laughs> that's pretty much you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's just I, I'm torn because, uh, as I've said many times, I'm, I'm still a recovering Republican. And I, I look at this and I just think, you know, at what point do we want to say enough's enough? Because it's a legitimate threat towards America. I mean, we, we know they've been doing missile tests. We have the, the, we have the documents. Mm-hmm. They've been doing the missile tests. Um, and at, at what point do we allow a rogue nation like North Korea, who, I mean, let's all be honest, Kim Jong-un, he's freaking insane. I mean, there's something mentally wrong with him. Um, I think he has a lot him. Brian, I think he has a lot of charm. You? OK, I don't know why you're bagging on him. He's, there's something <laughs> charming about my fellow dear leader. Um, I don't think it's the, uh, the haircut. Right. I don't, I don't think he's insane. Because the situation that he's at is that he's got to keep ramping up the revolution inside that one country on him. Because of the simple fact that and for him than a bot. Well, when I, say, when I say insane, I don't mean um, politically. I think okay. that what he's doing is, is is politically genius because he's he's trying to do what Pakistan has done. He's trying to get North Korea the the ability to have a nuclear weapon. Mm-hmm. For which then they are on equal playing field with other nuclear powers. I say insane because I look at how you know how brainwashed the the Kim Jong family has made North Korea, and how I mean they have they have basically made it into a a Hitler esque you know third or a third Reich almost uh, in North Korea, where you know they have their own versions of, of concentration camps, and I just think that that. For someone to be able to be the face of something so horrid, there must be something wrong mentally with that person. Um, whether it's that they are brainwashed, you know, from a young age, or they just truly believe that they themselves are that all powerful, our dear leader, you know, being the exception, that they can, you know, just destroy the the livelihoods of those within their country because it suits their own needs. Right. Yeah. 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 Because you know, uh, it's a prison, and it's it's awful. Because even if you get Everyone's there ratting on everybody there. It's that awful uh, 1984 prison state there. And everyone's a prisoner, even right. Kim, even even the Kims, that whole family, they're prisoners themselves. Yeah. Uh, I want to play a video from uh, the American Enterprise Institute, and it's called Why Does North Korea Want Nukes in 60 Seconds? Now, I've not played video, so hopefully this goes very smoothly. So the this is called North Korea, Why Do They Want Nukes in 60 Seconds from AEI. What explains North Korea's relentless quest for nukes and missiles? These programs are obviously not some bargaining chip, and regime survival is hardly their only purpose. My take, the North Korean regime intends eventually to fight a limited nuclear war in the Korean Peninsula and win it. Pyongyang plans confrontations it can win. The North Korean regime is not suicidal. It could not have lasted this long if it were. Its threats and provocations are never sudden impulsive outbursts. They're always carefully planned, rehearsed well in advance. If Pyongyang can force an American president to blink in a future Korean crisis, then the U.S.-South Korean military alliance will collapse. U.S. forces will be out, and the Kim family regime will take a giant step towards settling the still unfinished Korean War on its terms. All the pieces for the North's design are slowly but deliberately falling into place. The nukes, the missiles, the cyber war component. America and her allies must wake up to that design and counter it while there is still time. To learn more about... Now, the American Enterprise Institute Mm -hmm. is more conservative uh, on the conservative uh, side of the think tank. So, of course, they're going to be calling for action (laughs) instead of uh, what antiwar.com, which we will uh, announce here in just a second, 
uh, what, what they what they wrote. Justin Raimondo had a great article. Uh, do you guys agree with that assessment by the AEI? Brian, I heard you make a noise. I don't. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I don't. I mean, North Korea has nothing to gain if they start nuclear war. I mean, there there literally is nothing to gain because when when we say mutually assured destruction back in the Cold War, it was mutually assured destruction. If North Korea decides to to launch a nuclear war. I mean, it, or a nuclear bomb and start a nuclear war, I mean, they will be wiped out in a, in a blink of an eye, and the destruction that they cause would only be a fragment of what would be dealt upon them. So I, I think politically and, and militarily, it makes no sense for North Korea to actually start a nuclear war, but it does make more sense for them to have a nuclear weapon that they can then use as a bargaining chip for not only um, you know economic purposes, but also for uh, you know getting a seat at the table and having a voice on a, on a global stage. That's the that's the only logical step I see them making in this pursuit of a nuclear weapon. Yeah, I, I agree. They uh, dumb. They understand that if if they were having if they were to have a nuclear war on that tiny little peninsula, it it just won't add up. Well, it's easy to get to if you get on YouTube. Just watch the day after Hiroshima, the documentary. It will show you like what happened that in the little itty bitty time after like after, we, uh, after the United States government dropped the uh, um, that nuclear bomb on um, Hiroshima, and watching the devastation, the destruction that happened miles out, and the way it just way it worked. To anyone who it's to me. It's required watching for anyone that like salvages. Like, yes, we should put the nukes on the tables. Like, no, this is a horrible weapon. The way this thing kills is horrible. You know, talking about how people. You know, the luckiest people that died from this stupid bomb was the people who were directly underneath it that got killed by the light of it that turned into, instantly into carbon. Those people were lucky. Uh, the American Conservative, which is the American Conservative, was founded by partly founded by Pat Buchanan and uh, falls under the Paleo Conservative label, which is libertarian-ish in the, especially in foreign policy. And they uh, released an article by Daniel Larison this week called "Talking to North Korea is the Best Option Available." And uh, I want to read just a little bit of this because I thought it was very succinct. There are usually three main objectives to directly negotiating with a rogue authoritarian regime. The first and least serious objection is that it rewards their behavior, but this is a silly reason not to negotiate with another government if doing so allows ours to make progress in resolving a dispute. The second very tired objection is that diplomacy has been tried and failed, but in most cases this is either not true or very misleading. In this case, U.S. and allied diplomacy uh, secured an agreement that was succeeding in limiting North Korea's nuclear program, and then the Bush administration blew it up in pursuit of the fantasy of getting North Korea to give up even more. That backfired badly and led to the first nuclear test in North Korea's withdrawal from the NPT. The third objection is the, that the other regime can't be trusted to abide by any agreement that it makes. That is always a possibility in making any agreement, but if the agreement is perceived to be mutually beneficial, both parties will have strong incentives to honor its term. Also, I want you guys to take a look at another article. We've posted this up on the We Are Libertarians Facebook page. It's, uh, Justin Raimondo uh, wrote this article. What's the title of the article here? I know that you've got up. I've just got a little extract uh, from it. The Korean Crisis, A Way Out. Yeah, Justin Raimondo at antiwar.com is a, a great writer that you should follow. The latest North Korea nuclear test coincides with leaks from the Trump administration that Washington is demanding negotiate, renegotiation of CORUS, the U.S.-Korean Free Trade Agreement, and is preparing to withdraw from it. And therein lies a possible, albeit unintentional, resolution to the crisis of the peninsula. And he ar ar argues that we're going to withdraw from the South Korean uh, agreement, which I don't anticipate that happening i can't imagine that happening uh but it is an interesting theory and then uh there are also many people in south korea who are now asking the united states to put nuclear weapons in south korea now mm -hmm. uh which i also do not think that that will happen so uh what are some other things and interesting views that you've read on this brian Um, I'd say the, the most interesting uh, perspective I've had is, is the relationship that we will find between ourselves and Japan and South Korea due to our inaction. 
Um, one of the, the notions that I've heard toyed around is that if we do not take a, a hard approach to trying to deal with this threat, that uh, Japan and South Korea, who are arguably our strongest allies in the Pacific, would then have some negative ill will towards uh, you know, the United States going forward. Uh, the other is, is the interesting relationship we're seeing happen between China and Russia. Uh, both China and Russia have taken a, a stance against uh, any intervention with North Korea militarily. Um, and I think that's interesting just because, uh, you know, not only with our current relationship with Russia, uh, but also the fact that China is you know, easily one of our largest trading partners. And um, I, I, I genuinely am, am interested, and I say that, you know, not, not hoping it happens, but I'm genuinely interested to see what would happen if North, North Korea does something drastic what that will then turn into for the relationship between the United States uh, and subsequently Russia, uh, not only militarily, but also economically. All right, final thoughts? Anything, Harry? It's eventually going to come to head. South Korea does want more weapons there, but China and Russia probably will not want the United States dropping 1A nukes there that close to their borders. No matter how nicely nice we are to them, they don't want our nukes that close with a on, on land. Uh, the there are ways out of this, hopefully peacefully, uh, because uh, China and Russia, what they're mostly worried about is the out of Korea after a war like that and having to deal with all these uh, unskilled uh, people from basically from the 1950s there. But North Korea is a gigantic rabbit hole. It's Most things you read about North Korea, you have to understand that the country is a, it's in a very, very weird state and that most of the people... And the government also understands that 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 country mostly is sustained by black market deals. Most people get their food through black market deals. All the most of the officers eat and get all their money from black market deals. That's what keeping that country afloat. Whatever they're doing right now, it's they've got long planning on this. Who knows? So that's what I got. Brian, final thought. Um, I think yeah, I say Harry, I think Harry hit the uh, the nail on the head. I mean, honestly. I, I just think that this is a, I don't want to say it's a no-win situation, but it's its pretty darn close to it. Um, it's, uh, an action towards uh, North Korea militarily, and uh, it blows up in our face, um, or we, we hold off with inaction, and we, we watch North Korea possibly does something horrendous that we haven't seen happen on this, uh, on the face of the earth since 1945. So I'm, I'm not optimistic. Uh, now let's move on to our next topic. It is a video showing a Utah nurse screaming, being handcuffed after refusing to take blood from an unconscious victim. Uh, now this got a lot of circulation in libertarian circles, but I don't know how many people outside of our circle saw it. Uh, and I'll play a little bit of the video that went viral after we explained it a little bit. But a nurse says she was, uh, this is from the Salt Lake Tribune, a nurse says she was assaulted, assaulted and illegally arrested by a, sa uh, a Salt Lake City police detective for following a hospital policy that does not allow blood draws from unconscious patients. Footage from University Hospital and officer body cameras showed Detective Jeff Payne and nurse Alex Wubbles in a standoff over, the, over whether the policeman should be allowed to get a blood sample from a patient who had been injured in a July 26 collision in northern Utah that left another driver dead. Now, Wubbles said the blood cannot be taken from an unconscious patient unless the patient is under arrest, unless there is a warrant allowing the draw, or unless the patient consents. The detective acknowledges in the footage that none of these requirements are in place, but he insists that he has the authority to obtain the draw, according to the footage. At one point, Payne threatens... with a criminal case, and he says, I can either go away am, am I fair to surmise that? She's on the phone talking to probably a superior. Done. You're under arrest. Yeah. We'll go. So this is okay. No, we're done. We're, we're done. You're under arrest. We're going. We're done.
my attention and you were very triggered by this yeah it's very frightening to watch uh one just someone just assaulted like that and to watch this contempt of cop go out like this because usually when people see this see this long view of contempt of cop or against a working professional usually it's someone who's been pulled over or someone just walking and they're you know a lot of people can dismay and go after the you know like well you're being a smart butt you know but this is a uh, nurse who got kicked up for cop who got advice from hospital staff and was trying to do everything the worst part about like some of the worst parts about the video of the illegal arrest is the other cops around him watching the arrest happen and that, and watching office administrators and going like, "Hey, we're having someone from administrative. They're coming down here if they really want to talk to you, you know." And you're making a mistake. Stop what you're, what you're doing on this whole the whole aspect of it. Yeah. It's it's very gruesome to watch. And to some people, this is their first view of contempt of cop. It's a lot of it like this. Now you is, you keep saying that. What does that mean? That's just telling uh, uh, being dead to rights, having your rights, knowing your rights, and be having the ability to tell a cop no. Right. They're not used to that. They're not so it's contempt to a police officer in the same way of contempt of court. Yeah. Would be. Yeah, uh regardless of what your stance is on police officers, they're human and they can be wrong and when you and a, a, a lot of cops do not like being wrong. They feel if you question their authority, you're questioning every authority of every officer, but if and they, a lot of, lot of cops take it to a massive ex- extreme. Not all cops, but a lot of cops do. I have met cops, and I've quote, and I have, you know, mostly lawyers, pe- police officers. <laughs> right. And, uh, where, where, like, where you live? Where I live, you know, in Lords, and some Indiana State Troopers. Where like they, uh, they got the law wrong, and I told them that, and they and scared the crap out of me because there's like a crap I'm going down for contempt of cop, and they just stop, pause, call a superior, and go, "Oh, you're right." <laughs> Sorry. Right. And you're like, man, I wish I had this on tape. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, for those... <laughs> it usually doesn't happen that way. For those of you playing at home, Harry is black. Mm-hmm. So he is our racism what? insurance. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, if you were in Dear Leaders... I didn't know that. If you were in the nobility <laughs> donating $10 a month or more, you could watch the live stream and see Harry for yourself. His mm-hmm. beautiful hair has been destroyed by my headphones. Yep. It's all squished down. Uh, so... And that... It's one like of the sheep. and you know one of the contempt of cop was uh, being pulled over by a police officer with my Glock on my hip, right in my car. Now that, that one was fun. Yeah, I, bet. I can't. and like it really hit home for me one night when we were doing the podcast. And you know, whenever we uh, talk about issues with police brutality, we we always try to get you involved because you have a perspective. I I don't know what it's like to be a minority. I'm a uh, white. I'm a man, I'm successful, I'm handsome, I'm tall, I'm single. I don't know what it's like to be like you. <laughs> now, <laughs> so it's so you give a perspective that we don't often have. And when you said, you know, I watched the Philando Castile video and I'm afraid to leave my gun at home, so I don't want to, because I don't want to get killed. Yeah. Like, I've never had that thought in my life. Like, I've never had the idea that I might get killed by a police officer in the back mind even when i'm under a, a, at a stop being pulled over you know mm-hmm. i got i got i got a i got a, i had a situation where i may have uh, been going 50 over the speed limit and got caught uh nice. <laughs> but uh, and uh you know in that situation i was like hey what's up officer he's like hey man how are you now you harry <laughs> don't you don't know what that's like you don't know what this privilege is like no and so, but I think it really is, uh, it's something that white Americans don't understand is that interactions with police officers for black men like yourself is very scary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially like when you've got them dead to rights about different laws and rules. Uh, I remember getting pulled over with my cousin. We were out in uh, Greenfield, out in the middle of B- BFE, going to uh, Fields Junkyard, getting some from the junkyards. And right. We, and we were speeding, honestly. But who cares? The, the, the speed limit is real too low for that road. There's nothing hit but cornfields, and the fact that it's not 65, 70 in that area is stupid. Yeah. But that's besides the point. Moving on, like, so when we got pulled over, 
cousin who's Puerto Rican, so was, you know we're out there in the middle of BFE in the cornfield. I don't even with, know how that worked with my Puerto Rican cousin and myself. So he gets pulled over, they get in process, and they come over to my window. I'm just sitting there, and they're like, I you know asked for my license, and I was like, I don't have to give you identification. I'm I'm a passenger. You know I'm a passenger in this car. I'm not the one driving. And he sat there and demanded identification. So me being huge smartass, I handed him a. Uh, <laughs> Right. A uh, uh, now a lot of you can remember like a uh, remember Mech Warrior. They used to pass out if you got enough. If you got a, if you were high enough in the game, you could get a like an ID with your name, your call sign on it, and everything of your Mech Warrior Mech Warrior call tag. I handed him that. All right, that's palsy. <laughs> uh, when you when you first saw this video with the nurse, uh, what was your first reaction, Brian Nichols? Yeah. Um, well, let me rewind. Chris, because you asked, you know, did this get outside of libertarian circles? And and yes, a hundred percent, it did. Um, you know, my newsfeed on on Friday was was filled with a college in uh, in New York that was predominantly nursing majors, mm-hmm. and and they were livid. I mean, it it went viral on my Facebook feed um, from from people of all you know different political ideologies, conservative, liberal, uh, libertarian, mm-hmm. you, you name it, that were just outraged at what happened here. Um, now, look, now going besides the fact that what just happened was awful, we had to look at two different things too. Number one, it's it's the hospital's agreement that they had made with the police department that number one, you could not uh, take the blood from an unconscious person unless you had a warrant. Mm-hmm. Number two, had consent from a conscious person, or number three, that the patient was under arrest. So none of those were were maintained, which means that you know the nurse, based on just the the contractual agreement that the police department and the hospital had entered into willingly that since that wasn't met that she did her job yep. but like let's let's go beyond that constitutionally this is a strict violation of the fourth amendment and uh, i forget the name of the court case but i think it was just in the past year there was actually a case that reaffirmed that uh, you you needed to have consent um, or a warrant to uh, draw blood from an unconscious person or conscious person. You couldn't draw blood uh, forcibly. So, I mean, on all levels, both, you know, between two uh, consenting parties entering into a contractual agreement, but also on a constitutional scale, this was a strict, gross violation uh, of anything that was, was could ever be contrived as, as just. And there was a, an article from the Daily Caller that just came out uh, last night, I believe, that was saying that she was asking for it because of her demeanor, and it's just it's it's garbage mm. that there's this kind of mentality that we cannot look at uh, the the law authorities and the uh, sorry the law enforcement that we have the authorities that we have with some form uh, of you know questioning in their actions without having to say they were right 100 percent of the time. So, if anything, I hope that this opens up people's eyes across the board um, that you know there is. Pr- police out there who will take advantage of their authority mm-hmm. because they can because they have a badge and and yep. unfortunately like you've experienced harry that happens you know far too often in your own personal life and many african americans lives you know out there just because of the, the sole fact that you're black yes. so if, if anything i do hope that this this helps raise some awareness It's not. It's not also based on color skin. It's just based of just dealing with law enforcement officers. There's a huge mentality of law enforcement that don't want to be told no, and don't want to be challenged. It's not all based on color of skin. It does. Ha- it happens to people with mental dis- disabilities. People who are. are uh, let's see. The, I saw that one video. The guy was having a stroke, and they tasered the guy. Um, and it happens right, to yeah, yeah and it, 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 hap- it happens to it happens to white people, it happens to Asians, it happens to everyone that that have an interaction with a law enforcement that's having a a bad day, b uh, or is just like if something's wrong with them, like they've got something something else is wrong with them, and emotionally or, phys- or you know usually mostly wrong with them. It it's it, it crosses the spectrum and it, hopefully it touches people. A lot of people say that stuff doesn't happen. It's like hey, I can take eight hours and just show you video of just cops taking advantage. Tom, you say you've never seen a storm like this. 
Yeah, Tom. Uh, Aaron, <laughs> only one comes to mind. <laughs> that was, uh, I had, it's, CNN just automatically started playing. Uh, we'll, we'll play that for you in just a moment. <laughs> but they're like, the, uh, you can sit there and just take eight hours of like a video and just show people this type of stuff. But the cool thing is watching, like, this does, sp- this one spread. Like, even a Blue Lives Matter page said this was gross and that this was gone. This is, yeah. this is past the pale. And it did go through, it went through, it went through liberals, it went through conservatives. It- where on it was kind of weird to watch this go off and I was, I was telling a lot of people that were sharing this story where i was like whoa 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 this is this is a lot of red meat this is sharing around everywhere up and it didn't it kept checking out everything there's hosp- great hospital statements everything like this thing factually happened it just kept getting more and more layers on you know going through this, this, this doctor uh, that, that nurse was going through and because they were just so just wanting the 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 blood of that guy it's just to you know because they were probably acting like some you know because once because if the hospital takes his blood uh, it, it falls under hipaa that's his blood you know if it's the the, the, the yep. they, they can't get it once so the hospital find out that the it's like he was actually involved in an accident that killed someone. You know, if the hospital pulls that blood, that's his. They can't do yeah. anything with it. So they're what they're worried about is that he's sitting up there. If that guy is drunk or is on a drug, that hours are going to tick by, and that thing is going to fade out of and not be detected through the system. All right. Uh, final thoughts, very quickly. We're running out of time. Brian Nichols. Uh, uh, I think the, my final the, thoughts were covered pretty much there. All yeah, right. I'll defer to Harry. Um, my final thoughts is bravo to the uh, Utah uh, hospital of uh, making uh, showing to the police department making sure they can't talk to nurses now because honestly, if I was in that hospital that day that nurse got uh, got arrested, I would also try to sue the police department because you know what if something happened if I've got if I would have gotten hurt or someone would die, hey, you got, you brought a nurse out of the uh, you know out of that the ER and out of the hospital and there was Good one point. they were one nurse short and it's your freaking fault. Yep. Uh, Final issue tonight that we're just going to give you a little bit of an update on Hurricane Irma. It is uh, now the the biggest recorded hurricanes ever are 190 miles an hour. This is clocking at 185. Uh, Let's play a clip from Aaron Burnett uh, earlier tonight. It's Tuesday, September 5th at 830 here. Uh, And uh, this was just about an hour ago. This was an update on CNN. And Tom, you say you've never seen a storm like this. Uh, Aaron, only one comes to mind. 2013, in the Western Pacific, uh, it was Super Typhoon Haiyan. It was the largest tropical system to ever make landfall on any landmass on Earth, and it took over 6,000 lives in the Philippines. Well, that may be a, that may be a little alarmism here, Tom, but we're, we're having a little Internet problem. But I, I think... This underlines, uh, while it's while it's loading here. This underlines essentially how powerful this storm is, and it's it's this. You know, we had uh, Katrina, which was a more powerful storm than this actually, landfall, and then shortly after that, Rita hit the Gulf Coast. Mm-hmm. So it isn't uncommon for uh, two super hurricanes to hit at the same time. Yeah, and so uh, this right now um, it is maximum sustained winds. 185 miles per hour, well above 157 miles per hour threshold for a Cat 5. Uh, 157 is where it like, clocks at. And so uh, it is now in the Caribbean headed towards Puerto Rico and for uh, Havana and Cuba and Cockburn Town, which is a real place. I just learned this right now uh, looking at this map. Uh, it's Cockburn Town. And uh, it is supposed to be a Cat 4 by Friday at 2, and then a Cat 4 and make landfall around Miami sometime around Sunday. And then they're not sure where it's going to go. They don't know if it's going to go up the coast of Miami, head towards uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, go up to the Gulf Coast, God forbid. So they're really not sure exactly yeah, where this is going at. So, So... So, yeah, this is a big and dangerous storm, and uh, let's just play a, a little bit more of this CNN piece and uh, this fake news. In Takloban. This storm system here, Irwin's only 10 miles per hour uh, weaker. So, again, to make landfall with something so massive, I mean, it's... So, yeah, that's uh, Tom on CNN, Tom Sauber. Uh, and sorry that uh, my Internet sucks. So, yep. Harry, you'll, you'll get on that and fix that for us in no time, I'm sure. So... 
Uh, now, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to everybody in Houston, everybody in uh, in Florida, and hope everybody is safe down there. All of our Texas listeners are number one Texas in terms of listenership. Second is California. Third is Indiana. And uh, so we just want to thank everybody who listens to the program. And uh, listen, if you know someone in Texas, send them this podcast. Nothing will help them more than listening to We Are Libertarians in this time of need. <laughs> no, no, seriously, uh, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the Red Cross. Um, little story from, uh, the, uh, from Grandpappy Spangles past. Uh, the, the Red Cross left my grandfather to die on the beaches of Okinawa and uh, said, no, he's a goner. He ended up living, and uh, he he swore to he made everyone in the family swear they were not to donate to the Red Cross as as a result. But in times like this, they really do a tremendous amount of good in these disaster areas. And with two major storms at the same time, this is just it's really such a huge stretch for nonprofit organizations like the Red Cross. Uh, there's a lot of Christian organizations. There's some libertarian organizations that we're going to tell you about when we record on Thursday. I'll have some uh, uh, some libertarian uh, organizations that you can donate to that people have gotten a hold of me with. Um, but uh, be sure you know to donate to the Red Cross as they come into this time of need. And uh, you know, like I said, mm-hmm. donate to We Are Libertarians because we are. are <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, so, final thoughts for the entire episode, Brian. Thank you so much for joining us. It, it's uh, so nice to have you back on the show. And now, with I hope to have you on. Yeah, I mean, it's always great to, uh, to join my my well my W A L brothers and sister is some. We got and uh, no, I really do appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, to speak. Uh, on behalf of the Libertarian Republic, um, you know, we were, even though we're, we're different publications, you know, we do have a lot of uh, similar viewership and readership. So, you know, I really like to help foster that. But no, as, in terms of the, the news of the week, I mean, I think the biggest thing is going to be uh, the hurricane. Uh, if there's any Florida listeners uh, that are listening, you know, if you have to abandon your homes, bring your pets with you. Uh, that's just one thing, please, because, you know, believe it or not, they'll be terrified too. And they, they, I, I think. Pets in, are in general like little people. Um, I got my little cat Moe's here, so I couldn't imagine leaving him behind. So, yeah, that's uh, if anything, get get to uh, to save her areas. And uh, you know, God bless everybody out there in in, in uh, Florida, but also all those recovering from uh, from Harvey there in Texas. Harry, wow, yeah, definitely the pet thing that really gets me. Like, and I also feel sorry for anyone who like escaped the flood in Dallas, went back to Florida and now watch another hurricane come them. So whoever that one person is, be <laughs> very well, careful. It, it is. My grandparents just moved back up from St. Augustine, <laughs> yeah. Florida, and there was a bit major hurricane that was headed towards St. Augustine. It fortunately didn't hit them. But, I mean, the, the major, the eye of the storm was predicted to hit right where they lived, and they have a cat, and they evacuated late, and they couldn't take the cat to the shelter. They couldn't take it. I mean, they're like up and down all throughout central i mean it's it's really tough to try and find a hotel room mm-hmm. anywhere south of lexington right now i would imagine because <laughs> it, it will be especially when you wait as long as they did and so it's just tough to take their pets but if you can i mean please i mean it's it's i couldn't imagine leaving mittens and muffins behind well, maybe not m- mittens, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> mittens. Mittens is getting on my nerves lately. But uh, Harry, your final thoughts? Uh, the, the, with that, you talk. You know, just be careful the way you share that around, or when you talk to someone about that. Uh, let them. When you want to, if if you really want to show that, and they really, especially if they're like a, a huge. Or, or cop supporter, just show them the, the video and let them have their own conclusions, and then just be able to talk to them and have that conversation. Try not to beat them down with the whole different thing with it. Uh, the other thing I want to do is um, I, I probably put the link back into the uh, Facebook group, but I like everyone jumping in the Facebook group. I like everyone talking in there, but I also have the uh, We Are Libertarians Discord chat. Uh, James Neeson and I was in there the other night, and we, you know, were playing MMOs and like went on to stick screeching about like, elections and different stuff, like late until like the three. <laughs> yeah, so if you're a gamer, hit them up. I mean, we really want you guys to connect with us. I mean, we've got a lot of li- listeners, and it's so much fun for 
part of the be- the best part about the donation program is that we get to meet newer people because like when somebody gives us money it's like oh man that's awesome you know and so mm-hmm. we get to connect with people but join your discord follow us on twitch mm-hmm. uh f- you know make sure that you you follow all of us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. You have our permission, not just the yeah. wall stuff, but our personal stuff, too. Please feel free to follow any of us, uh, especially Kat. Mm-hmm. Send Kat and Agnos a lot of DMs. She loves that. She loves the oh, attention. Yeah. She loves those. Uh, she, 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 someone found her uh, Tinder and uh, <laughs> tweeted. She was really a fan of that. Uh, nudes. Send her nudes. All right. I'm just kidding with that one. Uh, you creepertarians, you are something else. We love you. Yeah, don't send her nudes. Send her uh, just a screenshot of how many Bitcoins you have. Right. Or cattle. <laughs> All right. Uh, I want to thank everybody who has <laughs> donated on the Patreon. We are up to, uh, literally, as we've been sitting here doing the show, we've had two more people join at the $10 a month level in the nobility. And uh, we're up over 700, I think we're almost at to 750 a month, maybe more. Uh, and so I want to thank all the people, the, the people that are $10 up in a month. We have a lot of uh, $5 and up people. Those people get uh, early access to the episode. It's CD quality, ad-free, it's a day early. And uh, if you're not listening on that feed, then you're getting ads, and it's, and it's 96 or 64K instead of the beautiful, crisp, clean. 128, uh, totally unedited with all the beginning and end and bonus segments and everything. And uh, helps grow independent media. And uh, and then at $10 and up, you get access to a special group. And on Tuesday and Thursday nights, you get to watch the show live and contribute, as so many people do. And then 25 and up, you get posters and you get a dated base of memes that Greg has almost finished uh, you, uh, you're going to get a free ticket to our live show on 9-11 if you want it, if you're in town. And then uh, 100 and up, after two months, you get to come on the show. You get to be on the show, and you get access to Dear Leaders Chambers. And uh, we've got two of those guys, Craig DeCosta and Jason Doolittle, Doolittle. Thanks so much to you guys at the $25 level. Thanks to Joey Turner, Heidi Aldbridge, Christian Emmett, Bard, Doug Stream, Chad Oakage, uh, Chris, Christopher Brokoff, and uh, Todd Singer. And then at the $10 level, thank you to uh, Joshua Sexton, Stone Aldridge, Eric Bartline, David Stovall, Brittany Jandry, Jess Nixon, Justin Mitchell, Derek Mishu, Mike Trunt, Rick Felker, Andre Myrick, James Zoldat, Zolads. And I'm bad with names. Send me how to pronounce your name. I'm sorry, especially you, James. James Eric Neff, Adam Herndon, Nick Akop, Travis, Chris Lane, Ryan Clancy, Ken Walker, Rebecca Cash, and David Anderson. Thanks so much to you guys. We appreciate you uh, supporting us uh, here at We Are Libertarians, and we thank you to everybody that considers donating, and that you will, if you can't donate, just share the show. We appreciate mm-hmm. it. You know, this isn't free to do. It costs us a month to run. And uh, we, you know, take this money and we put it right back into it and upgrade and do more. And, uh, it's not a profit. Ma- I think the only one that will start making money is I'm going to pay for Cat's gas because an hour one way and an hour back to come on the show. So uh, she's she will be the first unofficial employee of We Are Libertarian. So, <laughs> but you guys are allowing me to do that for her donation. So. For joining us here on this episode of We Are Libertarians, and on Thursday we promise Greg will be back Thursday. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Dude. Anytime, I'll be uh, more than happy to hop back on. Yeah, Harry, great to talk to you. I've uh, I've had fun listening to you over the past uh, few months when you joined the the show more often. So it's fun to uh, finally get to to meet you not not in person, obviously, but one day. Yeah, it's okay. One day, one day. One day we'll get on the road and be able to see people. All right, thanks, Brian. Yeah, come here to Philly. We have some fun. All right, see you guys. Thank thanks. You. Bye. Bye. Uh, that'd be a cool road trip. I demand Philly cheesesteaks, though. Well, Philly is the site in podcast movement 2018, so mm-hmm. it's a possibility. I used to do that drive of uh, when I was younger just to get a Philly cheesesteak. Uh, Christy says we need a better tagline. And Rick agreed. 
I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't like Christy when she sasses. I don't. It's okay. I, I appreciate that, Christy. And if you want to come up with it, you know. <laughs> All right. We love you guys. We will talk to you on Thursday.